Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, all right. Good. You talk better than a lot of my classes do. You know, when, when you're a teacher, a lot of times you just talk and no one talks back. So yep. <laughs> this is going pretty well. All right. Oh. Anyway, uh, so uh, today we're going to be talking about um, how love reigns over our present. Um, is there a video, Joseph? No. Okay. I wasn't totally sure, so we're going to say there's not. And next week, if my dad comes back and asks if we saw the video, we're going to say yes. <laughs> Just kidding. We're not going to lie. That's not good. That's not good. That's against a lot of things Jesus said, so we're not going to, we're not going to do that. But, um, yeah, we're talking about love reigning over our present. So last week, uh, we looked at love reigning over our past. Next week, love reigning over our future. This week is the present. Um, we're going to start off by looking in um, uh, John chapter 15, starting in verse 8. Uh, I encourage you, if you have your Bible with you, go ahead and turn to it in your Bible. Um, something I always tell the, uh, well, when I'm, when I'm teaching kids at camp, something I always tell them is that, uh, you know, to try to look at it in their Bible so they know I'm telling them the truth. Um, there's a lot of times that, uh, especially with social media now, you'll see things that are attributed to Jesus or that are called Bible verses and people say it's in the Bible and it's really not there. So I want you to know that what I'm saying is true, it's from the Bible. Um, Actually, there was a time at camp where a pastor asked everybody there, he said, where should we hide God's word? He was trying to get to, get to the point that we hide God's word in our heart. Um, but so he asked the kids, where should we hide God's word? And the little boy piped up, probably the Pentagon. Um, keep it nice and safe. Let's go ahead and look at John chapter 15, starting in verse 8. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer real quick uh, before we look at anything else. And um, I just ask him to be on the message today. So, Father, we thank you for your presence here today already in our worship and, and communion and for our fellowship with each other. Uh, we just ask that today, Lord, as, as the word is, is given, um, Lord, that you would reveal to us uh, what, what your heart is, Lord, and what you, Lord, what, what you desire um, uh, of us and for us, God. Uh, we just ask that your, your presence be here, Lord, that you give all of us uh, Lord, receptive hearts, that our hearts be good soil, so that when the words are planted, God, it, it takes root and it grows, Lord, and it affects our life. Uh, we thank you for your presence again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So in this passage, there's a lot of, a lot of talk about, um, about the Father loved me, so I have loved you, you love one another. There's a lot of love all over in this passage. Um, and I think it really shows what love looks like in our presence. All right. And the first aspect of this, uh, we have to know that God <laughs> loves us. That is the, that's the, the, the primary thing that the, before you really can love God, love other people, love the way you ought to, you have to understand the love of God first. Otherwise, the rest of it gets screwed up. Um, in this passage, uh, Jesus says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Then later on, he says, I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. All right. So, needless to say, Jesus loves you a lot because he says that he, no one can possibly love you more than if they give their life for you. And that's exactly what he did. He gave his life for us. Um, and in Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 1, it kind of breaks down more of what this love actually looks like uh, and the love that Jesus showed to us at the cross. All right, I want to look at that real quick because I think there's an aspect of God's love we don't always think about, um, but when you understand it, it makes it, uh, it, makes it much more powerful. Right. So Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 1 and then... Um, go all the way through verse 10. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him 
in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. All right, so that in a nutshell is talking about the love of God and his love shown to us at the cross and through his grace. All right, and there's a, a verse I want to uh, zero in on here, chapter 2, verse 5, where it says, even when we were, excuse me, uh, verses 4 and 5, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. So outside of Christ, and I know I've said this before, I'll say it again because it's true, it's true every time. Um, outside of Christ, you're not sick, you're not dying, you're dead. Um, there's, not a, there's not a shot for us to come spiritually alive outside of Christ. All right. And so what, what that means is this, so kind of before this, Paul, this is Paul writing, he talks about exactly what that means. It says that we're actually children of wrath. It says that we were sons of, uh, talks, refers to us as sons of disobedience, that we are following the prince of the power of the air, that Satan, we are following his power. Oh, it kind of goes through this whole list of things that we were doing that are against God. All right, so we have to understand here that just as much as God is, is loving, the reason that his love, that we know it's so great, is because we were so disobedient. We, that God, uh, his wrath, that we, we, were, we were deserving of his wrath. All right, that we were, uh, that God actually, there are things he hates, and those are the things that we practice. All right, so... I know a lot of times it's, it's weird to hear people talk about God hating things, but God hates because he loves. For example, I love kids, so I hate child abuse. Um, I love, I, I want to love everybody, regardless of color, so I hate racism. If you love something, you're going to hate anything that is negatively affecting that. Anything that threatens that, you're going to hate. And so God, because he is holy, he loves what is holy, he loves what is good, he hates everything that is against that. And so because of that, before we knew Christ, we practiced everything that God hated, and we didn't have the covering of Jesus' blood. And so the only thing that was there for us was the justice and the wrath of God. Because that's what we deserve. We deserve to be punished when we go against a righteous and a holy God. And so when you, when you understand that, you understand that God, that we did everything that he hated. He had no obligation to help us. There was no need that he had to do anything except for just give us what we deserve. And despite all of that, he decided of his own accord to come down, take on human flesh, allow himself to be tortured, to be beaten, to be mocked, to be ridiculed. And not only that, but because that was just his, his human flesh, but also God poured out his wrath on Jesus. That every bit of God's wrath, of God's anger, of the punishment that we deserve to, for our sin was put onto Jesus himself. And that's how you know how great his love is. It's hard to understand God's love for you until you understand how much you didn't deserve it. And once you understand that you don't deserve it, you understand that that's why it's so great. Because if you have to love somebody, that's not really love. If you have to, uh, my, my kids, sometimes they're nice to me in class, my students are. Um, and I know they're just being nice because they have to be. If I, if I see them out in the hallway, even, just, even still at school, but just in the hallway, they may, not, they may not say anything to me, they may pass me by. In the classroom, though, they'll be nice, all right? Because they, they want that good grade. Uh, they, they don't love me. Um, but when they don't, when somebody doesn't have to love you, but they still do, that's when you know that it's a real showing of love. One of the one of the ways, um, with. Of course, we know that love isn't just a feeling, it's not just an emotion, it's not just something that's on the inside. If you love someone, you see actions. All right? If you, uh, love isn't just something that you feel, it's something you see, it's something you do. Uh, if someone says they love you, and then they hit you in the face out of spite, they may not love you. Not with your brother or sister, I understand, there's little fights there. Um, but in general, if someone loves you, they're going to look out, they want what's good for you. They're going to be happy when something good happens to you. They're going to be... Uh, upset when something bad happens to you. They're going to try to help you when they can. And so if you're ever in doubt about God's love for you, look at what he's done. In the same way that if you want to know if somebody is truly showing you love, you can look at their actions. In the same way, if you want to know if God loves you, look at what he's done. Some of you guys may have ways in your own life you can look back and see where God's loved you. All right, But if you ever are in a, in a place where 
Oh, you're having trouble remembering the goodness of, of the Lord and the love that he's shown you. Remember what his word says. That, like we just talked about, even though we didn't deserve his love, he still gives it to us. That he died on the cross for our sins. This is what he's done. That, um, that he is a friend, that he'll never leave us. These are things that uh, he has done for us already. So we can see by his actions that he loves us and we can rely on that. And we can count on that and know that his love is real and is genuine. So before we talk about anything with love reigning over our, our present life, we have to understand the love that has already been shown to us. If we don't understand the love that God has, the love that we don't deserve, yet he chooses to give to us, it's not going to be possible for love to reign in your present life and to affect your current life. All right, so that's the first point today is to understand that God loves us. Right? Now, going back to the first passage we read, uh, Jesus said that this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. All right, so this is the second point I want to make today is that God's love causes us to love. That when we understand the love of God, it will affect us in a way that makes us want to love him and makes us want to love others. If it doesn't, then you haven't understood the love of God. All right. And to show this, we're going to look at 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. So, uh, here is, here's how it starts. Beloved, before we even go anywhere else, beloved, the very first thing John starts off with here is beloved. Until you understand that you are the beloved, that you are the one that's loved of God, the rest of it's not going to matter. Right. Until you understand that you are loved of God, it's not going to be possible for you to show his love to others. So understand that from the very first word here, here's a principle we can take. Know that you are the beloved. Right. Beloved. Let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love God, or excuse me, anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe that the love that God has for us, uh, or excuse me, to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he cannot love, um, excuse me, whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. We will love others because God loves us. All right? As it says in this passage, it says it over and over again, that we ought to love one another, that um, whoever loves God must also love his brother. It says um, that anyone who does not love does not know God. It's not, it's not possible for you to know God's love and to love him and not love other people. Um, now, it's possible in, in different moments because we're, we're a process. The Holy Spirit's growing us. It's not that you're perfect all at once. But there's a process of as you understand God's love and as you love him, that love will be shown to other people. That's what this passage is talking about. And if you see somebody who claims to know the love of God, but over and over again they refuse to love others, they'll do the opposite of that. They don't show their love for God. Something's fishy there. All right? When we understand God's love, there are actions that come out about because of that. All right. Um, and a key verse here, one that you, you, you may have heard many times, but we love because he first loved us. So again, we have to understand God's love, and then we love as a natural outpouring. His love is in us, it overflows, and that love is shared with the rest of the world. We will love others because God loves us. Um, in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 2, I don't believe this is on the paper, so you may have to turn to this one. You may not have an option if you want to read this one along. Ephesians chapter 5, 
uh, verses 1 through 2. Uh, it says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Again, be imitators of God. Why? Your beloved children, your love of God. And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself, gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice. Apple music will search for it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, yeah. That happens in school, too. Sometimes my phone will just do the same thing. All right. So, we love God because God loves us. Um, and if you think about it, this is kind of the way, um, you know, on earth, if you, if you love somebody and you know they love you, it makes you want to love them more. And if there's a mutual love, that love builds. And so in the same way, as you know God loves you more, you love him more, and that love that love builds. Oh, well, I mean, and what's one of the ways that you get to know somebody more? You get to you get to love them more. We, we you learn more about them. We learn more about what's good about them. They, they maybe you see different aspects of them that they're they're kind, they're uh, they're friendly, um, they they are willing to help. Um, as you learn more characteristics like that about a friend or um, or somebody else, that you you learn to love them because of those things. Well, in the same way, uh, we will learn to love God more as we learn more about him, as we learn more about that love, as we learn more about what he's done. And so that's one reason I encourage you, um, read the scriptures. Because it's one thing if you look at your present life and you don't feel very loved. You don't always feel love, even when it's there. But when you have something that you read, that the word of God has been implanted in you, and you can always think, no, like I know the Lord loves me because he gave his son for me. I know that Jesus loves me, he said he'd never leave me, he gave me the Holy Spirit. I, when you have these promises of God, when you know more about him and what he's done, it will cause you to love him more. So I encourage you, read the word, um, read the word, pray, keep coming to church. All those Sunday school answers you'd always say, well, what you should do, read the Bible, pray, go to church, things like that. There's a reason you've heard them so much, and it's because they're true. That as you do those things, as you seek the Lord through those things, you will learn more about him, and you will learn to love him more, because you'll see more of his goodness and his mercy on your life. Now, God's love reigning in our present life looks like us knowing God's love and overflowing as love back to God and love back to other people. Right? And that brings me uh, to our, our next point here, where Jesus says, Jesus said, abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And so we can see that love for Christ brings obedience to Christ. All right? That as we love God, we want to obey him more. Um, and this is something, again, we can see in our earthly relationships. Uh, now, me and my brother have fought our fair share throughout our life. I have definitely made him cry. He's made me cry before out of anger many times. But that being said, I love him. I love him, and I want what's good for him. And, so, and, I, and I don't want to do something that intentionally upsets him. I don't want to do something that makes him worse off. And so if he tells me something that's like, hey, um, don't hit me in the head with a baseball bat. Uh, there was a time I may have ignored that. But, uh, but I don't want to do that because that's not loving towards him, and I care about him, and I want to do what he wants in this case. I don't want to hurt him. Uh, if I see that there's something, a way I can help him, he needs help, I don't know, maybe moving stuff into his apartment or something like that. Um, and I have the ability to help him. I want to do that because I love him, and I want to help him, and I want to, and I want to be there to help him move when he needs that help. Um, in the same way that when we love Jesus, there's going to be actions that are following things that he wants, that are following things that are desires that he has for us and desires for that relationship with him, that when we love him, those actions will follow. All right? So let's look at... Um, uh, where are we here? Uh, John chapter 14, verses 15 through 21. So we, we read from John 15 earlier. We're going to look at John 14 now. It's all, it's all part of the same, um, the same conversation Jesus is having in 14 and 15 and some other chapters where he's talking uh, about a lot of different stuff. But going back to verse 14, starting in verse 15, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me, because I live, you also will live. 
In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So, this first verse here, I feel like it can be very easily taken out of context, kind of abused and made to sound in a way it's not supposed to sound. All right, so if you love me, you will keep my commandments. This isn't a threat. This isn't Jesus saying, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. This isn't him saying, if you love me, you will. It's, just, it's, a, it's a cause and effect. If we love Jesus, we're going to, more and more, as he, his love grows in our life, and as the Holy Spirit grows us, more and more we're going to want to keep his commandments. It's not a, it's not a threat. It's not a, or else, it's a cause and effect. If you love me, you will. It's the tree and the fruit. It, it, Jesus talks about, all, right, all throughout the New Testament, not just Jesus, but a tree and its fruit. Um, how a good tree has good fruit, a bad tree has bad fruit. Um, actually, in another story from camp, uh, we didn't know that we had a peach tree at camp. Uh, all of a sudden, the, the, the uh, groundskeepers there were mowing or weeding or something and came across a peach tree. Do you know how they knew it was a peach tree? It had peaches. That's how they knew. There's a whole area there that's called Walnut Grove, full of walnut trees. You know how we know they're walnut trees? Walnuts. They got walnuts. Uh, we used to have a plum tree at one of the houses we lived at. It had plums. Whatever type of tree you're looking at, it's going to have the fruit that corresponds with that. That's the idea here. That when, if you are a follower of Christ, the fruit that people see, the actions people see, are going to correspond with that. Now, again, that doesn't mean you're perfect. We're not saved by works, as the passage we just read said. Um, we're, not, we're saved by grace, not of works. But when we see God's grace in our life, works will come. We're going to want to respond to God's love in a way that shows him and shows others that we love him. Where are we at here? Oh, yes. Uh, one more example to kind of uh, talk about the relationship here. Because again, I, I want to be very clear. We're not saved by what we do, but when we are saved, what we do changes. All right? If, um, if someone were to run into this building right now and say, there's a bomb downstairs, the building's about to collapse, just for, just for legal purposes, that's not true. Um, so do not run out of the building right now. But if someone were to run in here and say that, and I said, wow, that's crazy, I believe you, and didn't move, would you think that I believed them? No. Uh, if, if some, if, now if I, if they said that and I said, okay, and then I ran out, that would show that I believed them. See, I can say that I believe somebody as much as they want, but until I act upon what they say, I probably don't believe them. Um, if someone were, uh, were to, were to tell me a similar thing, I don't know, maybe in school, maybe because I'm, I'm taking classes right now at the same time I'm teaching classes. If my professor were to say, all you got to do to get 100 in this class is just show up and wave at me. And I showed up every day, and I didn't wave. I either just be lazy or I just wouldn't believe them. But if I showed up every day and waved, that professor would know that I believe them, that I, took, that I actually believe what they said because I'm actually going to act on it. It was the same way with Christ. It's not that um, it's not that our works or it saves us, but when he tells us something, we can people can tell if we believe him because we'll pretend like it's true. We'll act upon his words as if they're true. Uh, and so that is kind of the relationship there between works and um, our faith and what this is talking about. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Well, if you love Christ, if you believe him and you put your faith and your love in him, then naturally this is going to be the effect. Now, along with this, because, of course, we know that our, our as human, we, our, our flesh is always kind of battling against, against you know, what God wants in a lot of ways. So we're not left alone. In this passage, Jesus says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. So Jesus says, I'm going to give you a helper. So understand that as we are loving God, uh, he isn't just putting us out there on our own and telling us, all right, do your best. He's giving us the help that we need in order to accomplish this. All right, turn to Romans chapter 5, verse 5. I'm not sure if that's on your paper or not. It may be. It is. All right. Well, it's in the Bible, too. Um, Romans chapter 5, verse 5. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. 
So not only is the Holy Spirit our helper, that's actually the way that God's pouring out his love to us. God's love has been poured, poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. So God sends us the Holy Spirit as a helper, and through the Holy Spirit, God's love, that his powerful um, this all-powerful agape love that's, is being poured into us through the Spirit and it's overflowing and showing itself and keeping Jesus' commandments and works and good fruit. That is what's going on here. The Holy Spirit is the catalyst that's allowing God's love to fill up and overtake our lives and empowering us to follow in his commandments. So and I, I want to also be clear here that I don't want to make it sound like when you follow Jesus, you're not going to ever make a mistake because that's not true. Um, in fact, it, it's something that I, I heard that, I mean, that it's just scriptural. I, I, I didn't just hear it, but um, something that the Bible talks about is that when you have the Holy Spirit, he's empowering you to fight against sin. And so if there is a fight against sin, that means that the Holy Spirit is active in your life. All right? People who aren't concerned about the Lord a lot usually aren't concerned about their sin. Usually aren't concerned about, I want to follow Jesus. So if you, if there's, I don't want to make it sound, again, like you're perfect, there's not going to be any struggles in life at all. But if you, in your life right now, there's something you're, you're struggling with that the Lord's helping you to overcome, that, that's good. That the struggle is there. If you didn't have Christ, the struggle wouldn't be there at all. So understand that the Holy Spirit, he, he is empowering you. And so if, there's, if there is that fight against sin, that's evidence that the Holy Spirit is working in your life. Turn to Romans chapter 12. We're going to look at a few verses here. All right. Because now we've talked about keeping Jesus' commands. I just want to take a couple minutes and talk about what that looks like. Because um, it's easy to talk in very general terms. Uh, I want to, at least for a little bit, have you know, some more specific ideas of what this looks like. Right. So in Romans chapter 12, uh, verses 1 through 2, um, Paul starts off by saying, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. All right, so this is kind of Paul going, he's talking, before this in Romans, a lot of us is talking about almost just like theology, the doctrine of salvation. What did Jesus do at the cross? And then he goes, here it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. So because of God's mercy on you, because of God's love towards you, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. He says, uh, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. So understand that as you read the word, as the Holy Spirit transforms you, he is, he's renewing your mind. That the way you think is going to change. That the way that you look at the world is going to be a little bit different. That as you grow with Christ, the Holy Spirit changes you. The way you see things is going to change. All right, so um, so that is one way uh, that the Spirit has changed us. As we read the Word, our worldview is conformed to the way that God sees the world. All right, and just going on through uh, through the Scriptures here, um, verses three through eight. I won't read them all right now, but that talks about gifts. Uh, my has a little title here in my Bible. It says "Gifts of Grace," it's talking about spiritual gifts. All right, so understand that when you're in Christ, you have spiritual gifts that the Lord will use in his work. So what's one of the ways that you can show God's love to others? However he's gifted you, use that to love to love others. Maybe he's, uh, I mean, it, it talks about in the scriptures that a whole range of gifts, whether it's speaking in tongues, prophecy, those things, or it may just be, the Bible talks about gifts that are more hands-on, like metalworking. Maybe your, maybe your gift that you can use to love other people is that you're, you're really good at fixing cars so you can help them out when they need help. Maybe your spiritual gift is that uh, that you're you're good at woodworking. So when we're making these garden boxes, you're going to be able to help put those together so that people will have ways to grow food and to help people in need. Uh, whatever your, your gift is, you can use that to love other people and to show God's love towards them. All right. Uh, going on, there's some other things that Paul just goes through here. Let love be genuine. Don't fake love people. Eventually that, that shows. All right. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. All right. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. This is verse 9 and 10, by the way, if I didn't say that. Um, so he's just kind of shooting off the list here of here's ways that you can follow God, follow his commands, ways that we can show this love. Let this love be genuine. Don't do what's evil. Actually, hate what's evil. Hold fast to what's good. All right? Love one another with friendly affection, so show your love to each other. Outdo one another in showing honor, so try to show honor to other people who are around you. And that as, as you see that you have the chance to honor them in, in front of other people, to, to do that. 
All right. Um, do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. So uh, rejoice in hope, be patient. So if, you're, if, you, uh, if you have hope of something good the Lord is doing, rejoice in that. If, you, um, if you're going through something, be patient. The Lord's still there. He's saying to be patient through that. He says to be constant in prayer, regardless of where you're at, always pray to the Lord. All right? Uh, contribute to the needs of the saints. So at this time, uh, Paul would go around and he would collect money to, from more prosperous churches to help saints who were starving in other places, who were under heavy persecution, needed help. And so he may have been specifically referring to that here, but the more general concept is the same, that if we see a brother or sister who's in need and we have the opportunity to help them, we should show them that love. And First John, it says to love with, in truth and action. Uh, James says, if I see... Uh, a, a brother in, in need, and I just say, the Lord be with you, and I walk right past him, that it means nothing. I've, I've done nothing. If I had the ability to help somebody, then I should. That's what he's saying here. Um, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. If somebody uh, is your enemy, if somebody's cursing you, don't fire back right, don't fire right back at them. Bless them. Don't curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Is there somebody around us that's celebrating something? Well, let's celebrate with them. Is there somebody who's mourning something, maybe a death or a sickness? Well, we can mourn with them. We can be there with them in that sorrow. And then, um, and our presence also shows them the Lord's love while we're there. Um, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. So no one's too low for us. There's, no, we, we're not, there's nobody that's in a stage of life that we shouldn't associate with them. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. So our attitude should be, uh, if, it's, if I have the choice of either trying to upset people the way I'm doing something or not, I should try not to upset them. All right? As much as it depends on us, we should try to be at peace with everybody. Now, I understand sometimes that's not always possible. Because it may just be that our, just by the fact we're Christians and we have certain values, people are going to hate us. The Bible talks about that. But if we have the choice between the, our actions and how we do it, let's try to live in peace with people. That's what Paul is saying here. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Uh, to the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will be burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So if anyone, again, is persecuting you, is being uh, just evil toward you, you're not evil back. In fact, you do the opposite. You pray for them. You bless them. You do whatever you can to help them. And the Bible actually says that that's going to be like putting burning coals on their head. If someone's being evil to you and you're being kind back to them, that's probably not going to rub them the right way. So you're going to be doing what you're supposed to be doing, and then, and then really they're probably still not going to like it anyway. Now, again, and the, whole, the whole scripture, of course, is filled with you know different commands that Jesus wants us to follow, but they're all kind of summed up with what Paul says here in chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. Oh, owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment, uh, yeah, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. So all there's a, a lot of things we can look at that specifically the Bible says for us to do. But the, what Paul says here is that it's all summed up with one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Um, we love God, we love other people, and that's all just an outpouring of God's love in our life. We see the love that God has shown us. It makes us love him, it makes us love others, and we treat them in such a way that they know they are loved. And we act in such a way that the world knows that we love God. And that's the natural progression. And again, it doesn't happen all at once. I'm not saying that we're going to be perfect right away. But there's going to be an ongoing growth in our life where there's more and more love being shown. As we understand more and more fully the love that God has shown to us. So, one more time, I want to read this last passage. Um, in John chapter 15. And then uh, we'll go ahead and close in prayer after that. So John chapter 15, we're going to read verses uh, 8 through 13 here. 
Actually, it's 8 through 14. I think that's the wrong thing right down on my paper. This is the chapter. This is what we started off with. This is kind of what we've been uh, trying to ground all of our stuff in here today. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord uh, with prayer. So Lord, uh, we, we thank you today um, for your, uh, your goodness and your love towards us, God. That even though we were um, dead in our sins and our trespasses, that you showed us your love and your mercy and your grace on our life. Um, Lord, and that that was the ultimate the ultimate show of love that you could have shown. Uh, we just ask that, Lord, you, you remind us every day of that love, that love that you've shown us. We ask that, um, that God, you give us a deeper and deeper understanding of you and your goodness and your truth, so that, Lord, that love overflows in our life through the Holy Spirit, God, as the Holy Spirit teaches us and leads us unto all truth. We ask that, Holy Spirit, you remind us constantly of the Lord's love in our life. Um, Lord, uh, what we, we ask that... Um, Lord, that as we, as we love you and we love others more, God, that you help us to, to follow your commands, God. We know that as we love you, Lord, that will happen. So please lead us into more and more love for you. Uh, please lead us into a greater, greater understanding of you, Lord. And as that happens, um, Holy Spirit, please bring us to show that fruit in our life, to show us, um, Lord, to, to show that the love that you've given us does truly reign over our life, God, and reigns over our decisions and our actions. Um, I thank you for what you've done, Lord, and I ask that you... Um, Lord, just put your uh, hand on us today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So what we're going to do now, uh, we're going to sing about uh, uh, what a friend we have in Jesus. All right, And as we do that, I want you to think about the Lord's goodness and the goodness he's shown you, the love that he's shown you, and having a friend that's in him. Um, so we'll sing that and we'll, we'll close the prayer afterwards.